So once upon a time, there was a mermaid floating around the Algo Bay near Port Elizabeth. And in January of 1996, that mermaid got into a car and headed north, left the seafront of Port Elizabeth behind, left the friendly winds behind, drove past the desolate Kharib Dam, even further north into the, the Free State, the wheat fields of the Free State, and eventually pulled up outside a ground floor miner's apartment in the town of Allenridge, which is near Valcom, in the Orange Free State, in the Valcom gold fields. And this was a moment of realization that this mermaid was definitely out of water now. And um, my major had been geology, and I'd been in the top three of my class, and I didn't realize what was going to happen by accepting the bursary that I did, because my other major was zoology. And I was really quite happy taking tourists for walks through the green canopies and taking people scuba diving in the bright blue waters of the Titsikama. And now here I was with the, um, the dry mealies and the concrete mine shafts and um, the dust storms that used to come in the afternoon where at three o'clock in the afternoon you had to switch the street lights on. And this was a big change. And I was one of the, the first women to work underground on all the mines I've worked on. And um, the environment on these mines is very much like a soccer or a rugby um, change room, I guess. Not that I've been in one of those, but it's my guessing that it's part ego, part testosterone, there's horseplay, there's practical jokes, and this is the, the operating environment that is largely underground on a mine. It's very privileged to be one of the only women working underground in those days. And now that experience, coupled with my work in technology applications, gives me a very unique view of the mining sector, both here and globally. And it's that different view that I have of the mining sector that I believe is prudent to be able to share with you all today. Normally what we do is we get to view the world from above. But what I'm going to do today is show you the world from below. The best way of me explaining this scene is if I were to come into your office and take your desk and send your desk two and a half kilometers below the surface and then ask you to get underneath it for about six to eight hours. And to make it more realistic, I'd have to turn the lights off too. <laughs> and this stoping environment that you see here is, is the main face of what it looks like in our gold mines. And it's this environment that is home and the fabric of South Africa. It's the mining environment which is brought to the development that we do have. The city of Johannesburg, Egoli, it's the families, it's the communities that have all established themselves around mining scenes like this. What you must realize is that mining is largely with the migrant people, and be it immigrants that came all the way from England, or Ireland, or Turkey, bringing skills like plumbing, as electricians, as carpenters, they all migrated to this country to share their skill base. People that came from the rest of Southern Africa, the people that came from around South Africa, and all congregated here in the gold mines because this was where the future was going to be. This is where everybody's dreams were. This is where we were going to make something of our lives. All around the mines. The problem is at the moment that the mining sector is kind of need, is on life support. We are really challenged. And the times need to change. But change is really hard. None of us likes to change. Status quo is, is far easier to, to deal with. But the sector is constrained. Our margins are tight. And from an economy which developed exactly the city that we're sitting in today to where we are now, if we're going to go forward, things do have to change. So I'm going to share today three truths about the mining sector. And um, the first truth that I need to share with you is that mining is very conservative. <laughs> it's one of those sectors where things take time to change. Think about the Model T car. From the car to today's modern, highly engineered, specified cars, quite quick change. Even better, think about that brick of a cell phone we used to carry around not so long ago, 
and compare that with the smartphones of today. Think how quickly that change occurred. But in the mining sector, this is a coal shovel from the 1800s. And if you compare that coal shovel, as you will, with a coal shovel from today, there's marked similarities. And this is the challenge of the mining sector, is that it is conservative and technology penetration does take a while. So we're in this world where we've got all these technologies changing, but we're kind of on our back foot in the mining sector. The second truth that I need to share with you today is about the rocks. Gold and platinum. Platinum on the left, gold on the right there. These deposits that we have here in South Africa are exceptionally unique. There's no deposits like these anywhere in the world. The reason being is that they're quite narrow. Our gold reefs are about 20 centimeters, 40 centimeters thick. But what they lack in vertical extent, they carry on for absolutely kilometers. There's loads of um, copper, um, platinum and, um, and gold under the, under the surface, but we are constrained by our mining methods at the moment, and we are constrained by depth. So if you think about that table that you're sitting under that you've now two kilometers under the ground, the reason why we have to take out that whole table is that it's illegal to put people into spaces less than 1.2 meters high. So that's the mining environment. I work down there for seven years every day, sitting in 1.2 meters high. And um, the challenge is, is that we're taking out 1.2 meters high of rock when we're only actually looking for the 20 centimeters of rock. And so those are the constraints that we're needing. We're needing to find mining methods. Instead of taking out all this waste, let's just focus on the gold we need and thereby change how we're going to be mining in the future. Where we are right now in the South African mining sector is very similar to what happened in America in the 1970s. America had a lot of copper mines, and those copper mines were the best in the world. But through time, they also got marginal. They started losing money, and they started closing. Very similar to what's happening here in South Africa at the moment. Also, what happened is South America switched on their copper mines. They discovered very, very, very large, low-grade deposits. And so these competed with the North American deposits. And that could have been the end of the story for the North American deposits. But you know what happened? Technology came around. They discovered a processing technology that allowed people to unlock the high-grade copper deposits of America again, thereby switching back on all those mines and be gaining competitiveness. And that's the same thing where we're sitting right now in South Africa. We're needing technologies that are going to be able to switch back on our mines, make them competitive, and be able to bring back the mining sector into the economy like it once was. So the third truth that I want to bring to you is about this technology, is that um, what are we needing to do is that I sit in quite a privileged position in, in my current viewpoint of the market. On my side of the fence, I get to see what all the mining companies, what all the producers of machinery are doing in the technology field. And all the companies are trying to tackle this problem in a slightly different way. The true problem is that mines are factories. Hard rock, gold and platinum mines are factories. We drill, we blast, and we clear the rock. Then we go and we drill and we blast and we clear the rock. But a soft um, rock environment like coal, this is a coal cutter that can work all the time. It's continuous mining, it improves efficiencies, and production can occur all the time. And this is the holy grail of mining that we're trying to currently achieve in hard rock mining, is to be able to turn a batch process into a continuous mining process. And various companies are doing this in various ways. Some people are taking the big machinery that we're so used to seeing and shrinking it, down a little bit to ultra and extra low profile equipment. What some companies are doing is that they have taken tunnel boring technology. And instead of boring tunnels that we're familiar with to build roads and such like, we're going to be tunneling out the reef such that it's smaller holes, no people need to be there, and it can be safe. And then the other thing that is being worked on is in robots. We have an opportunity at the moment to, to develop robotic platforms, and these robotic platforms will be entering the mine stopes, and they've been ruggedized, they are able to traverse, we're able to put a variety of sensors onto them. 
such that through 3D imaging, through Xbox Connect, through a whole range of technologies that are used in a variety of other fields, eventually bring them to the mining sector and push the mining sector where it needs to go, such that we too can switch back on the mines that we've got. Suppose the story wouldn't be complete if I didn't say, well, what next? This is what's happening now. I mean, these examples that I've shown you, some are being tested at the moment, some are in use at the moment. But what's even further down the line? Further down the line is the opportunities to expand our horizons because the reality is, is that the need for resources is not going to change. It really is not. All the renewable energy stuff is going to rely on mineral commodities too. So we do have to find new ways of mining. So we've got opportunities to go to the seafloor where they're extracting sulfides from the seafloor. One of the other opportunities is in space. Currently we're working with partners where we're drilling on Mars. Yes, we've taken drilling techniques that we use here and we're busy coring on Mars at the moment and we get these, these cores back and see what they look like. There's also asteroid mining where we have the ability to harness asteroids in their space mining programs. So forget platinum in Rustenburg, maybe we'll have platinum on Pluto. And um, so this is where the mining sector is going. The mining sector needs to, to leapfrog at the moment. It's always been underpinning the economies and we've been left behind. So this is the world that we need to challenge. We've got to take the leap of faith. The same way I took a leap of faith when, when I ended up working on the mines. I don't remember my first day underground, but apparently a whole lot of guys do. You see, I entered the stope at the top end and by the time I'd come to the bottom end, everybody had left. They were scared, I was apprehensive, and it was about constructing, getting over those fears. The mining sector was changing then. Nobody had seen women working underground before. I had to overcome those fears. The mines I was working on had to overcome that change and that distinction. When I went for my blasting tickets, they threw the book of questions at me. The guys were asked one or two questions and I got asked questions all the time and eventually I think they ran out of questions to ask so they had no other recourse but to, to give me my blasting certificate and when I got it that meant that I was the second woman in the free state to get an underground blasting certificate. And um, that takes change, that takes bravery. All the mining environments, it's, this is the change that's, that's really needing. People would ask me, so do you, what do you do on the mines? Do you answer the phone? And I said, no, I don't answer the phone. I show the men where to mine gold. So, so these, are the, these are the challenges. But the beauty of working on these mines is that it's about the families. Generations and generations of people work in those stoping areas. So it wasn't about bringing a suitcase of degrees. It was about sitting underground in the muck piles and asking people about their lives finding out about what made people tick. Why do we come to the mining sector? And this is the very fabric of exactly this we are the people. Because in Joburg, we are the people and we are mining as well. Near Valcom, there's a town called Virginia. And um, it's a mining village, mining town, and it's an interesting place to, to be very mining. And I had a fortune to be able to go to Minnesota in America in the 2000s and go and see the iron ore mines. And they took me to near Duluth, a village, and the village was called Virginia. And in a split second, my mining world was suddenly so small, talking to the people in Virginia in the Free State and Virginia in Duluth, Minnesota. And for me, it just underpinned how important these sectors are to people and the change that we're trying to make at the moment. You know, when they first put out electric light bulbs way back when, the New York Times put out a warning to people to say, beware, these light bulbs are going to cause blindness. That was the skepticism which new technology was treated back then. It's kind of a bit of the same in the mining sector at the moment where we're quite skeptical about all these technologies. But like I gave the example of America, we're needing ways to switch back on mining. We're needing ways for this South African economy to once again believe in mining, believe in the potential of, of what exists. We've got the gold, we've got the platinum underground. It is just not sustainable to work with these highly skilled, unskilled labor practices that are going on at the moment. And the only way we're going to get around that is by pushing technology deployments. 
And that's the challenge. That's what we've got to look at. I'm sure in all of your areas, you've got technological challenges too. Think about them. Don't be scared of them. I guess at the end of the day, you know, I'm really optimistic and hopeful about the role of technology in South Africa and being able to bring this slightly different view of it. And I guess at the end of the day, having this mermaid that was definitely a fish out of the water at the beginning, maybe she too can find the robot and live together happily ever after. Thank you.